Okay, um, we are back. This is Senate Health and Welfare, and we're continuing our discussion today on January 6th. And the discussion before us now is a, a fairly critical and important workforce development report that was embedded in H-155, a bill passed Act 155 uh, from a bill passed through the House and the Senate. And the, this committee did a significant amount of work on that bill. And it was in the 2020 uh, year. So it's not, if you look for it, it won't show up in 21, 22, but it will show up in 2020. And thank you, um, Director of Healthcare Reform Bacchus for being here with us and to walk through the workforce development report. Give us a kind of, if you don't mind, give us a quick picture of the work and the folks who've been working on this. And then the, I think the executive summary and recommendations would be extremely helpful. I don't, you know the timing of this better than we do and what it will take to get through everything. So I'll leave it to you. Thank you, good morning and happy new year. My name is Ina Backus. I am the Director of Health Reform at the Agency of Human Services. If I could, I'd like to share my screen to walk through the information this morning about the Healthcare Workforce Development Strategic Plan. And Let me just see if I can adjust my settings here so that you're able to see the slides. Can you put it on a full screen like a, a slide uh, slideshow? Yeah. Yes. From beginning, you'll get it. Yeah, that's good. How does that look to you? You, good. Okay, I think we can I, see you've got you've got your next slide up as well, and I don't know how you get rid of that one, or you can. I think there's a place you can click underneath the first slide, and no, that's your that's your those are your comments. It's a change in the display settings at the top. Yeah. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Thank you. That's why yeah. we have Aaron. I think you want that one. If that one doesn't work, try the other one. There we go. This looks great, thank you. Um, you probably have heard that we use a Teams platform um, and as I'm not so used to Zoom, I appreciate your patience. For the agenda um, this morning, I, I think it's important to review the primary charge uh, for the healthcare workforce development strategic plan. Uh, as well as the process um, to date regarding the plan. I would like to provide some background and context for the current healthcare workforce challenges as these are certainly rapidly evolving as the public health emergency and the pandemic continues. And finally, um, to review with you the recommendations that we arrived at with the advisory group that informed the Healthcare Workforce Strategic Plan. So first, as uh, Senator Lyons explained, Act 155 of 2020 asked that the Director of Health Reform maintain a current healthcare workforce development strategic plan, and that plan be informed by an advisory group of 11 members. The advisory group um, with those 11 members is represented here for your review. There was membership from the Green Mountain Care Board's primary care advisory group, the Vermont State Colleges, the Area Health Education Centers, federally qualified health centers, Vermont hospitals, physicians, mental health professionals, dentists, naturopathic physicians, home health agencies, long-term care facilities. I also want to thank those subject matter expert, experts that participated from across state government. Uh, they were not designated members of the group, but they provided much needed expertise and content to the advisory groups um, 
deliberations, and those include participants from the Blueprint for Health, the Department of Labor, the Division of Vocational Rehab, Green Mountain Care Board, the Office of Professional Regulation, and the Office of Rural Health and Primary Care. I thank them again for their participation with the group. The advisory group informed the strategic plan that we'll review today. That plan was submitted to the Green Mountain Care Board on October 15th of 2020. And this was in accordance with an amended timeline uh, that was um, amended through last year's big bill um, to allow for more time for the group to deliberate again in light of the public health emergency. The plan was presented to the Green Mountain Care Board on October 20th, I apologize, there's a typo here. It was actually presented on the 20th of October and not the 15th. Plan the, then with feedback and public comment, um, there were some revisions that were presented to the board on November 12th and it voted unanimously to approve the November 10th, excuse me, and it voted unanim unanimously to approve the plan on November 12th. You know, was that in 2021 or 2020? Oh, goodness, it is 2021. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, all, all a mistake here. 2021, thank you very much. It would be very prescient if it was in 2020. I wanted to provide some current context for the healthcare workforce challenges that will serve as a background for the recommendations in the report. As you are aware, we're experiencing what has been termed the great resignation uh, for the workforce on the whole in, um, in, in our country. This has been prompted by the pandemic. Americans are quitting their jobs in record numbers. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce reports that employers in South Dakota, Nebraska, and Vermont are experiencing the greatest challenges as the total jobs available outnumber the total workers to fill them. And importantly, unlike past recessions where the health care sector saw jobs growth stable and continue to grow, in this recession, the healthcare jobs sector is falling alongside jobs in, in other sectors. And that is, at least um, in recent history, uh, unusual, um, un unusual to see. And of particular concern, as we are, as you all know, um, confronting uh, the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Here in this chart, um, you can see that healthcare, uh, that health and human services employment in all sectors is below what it should be. Um, the percent difference in November 2021 for health employment by setting versus what's projected to be a, the, an adequate level of employment in the absence of the pandemic is represented here. Again, for every area of the healthcare sector, the job, um, the employment is below what it should be. And you can also, also appreciate where um, there is, is uh, significant differences in employment for certain types of um, healthcare providers. This is national context. I don't, um, I, I don't want the committee to apply these numbers uh, to Vermont, I, but I think this is important background um, because Vermont is experiencing trends similar to the nation, but these are not Vermont specific numbers. We can also see that and over the last decade, um, between 2009 and 2020, Vermont's home care workforce has declined and Vermont's home care workforce has declined, um, interestingly, where it has um, grown in many other states. Here in Vermont, we have experienced decline um, with this workforce. The home care workforce is defined as, as com combined employment counts for two occupations, which are personal care aids and home health aids. So these, these two types are what 
are represented here. And you can appreciate that we have seen uh, fewer of those workers available per 1,000 people with disabilities um, over the last 10 years. In order to maintain Vermonters access to healthcare services amid um, this amid this unprecedented um, shifting in in the employment sector, um, health providers are relying on traveling staff. Uh, traveling staff from staffing agencies um, are necessary in order for continuity of operations and uh, to provide high quality care. But those traveling staff um, do do come at a cost that is uh, many multiple times more than the cost of employed staff. From hospital fiscal year 2020 to projected 2021, the hospital association reports that the use of travelers um, has increased 26 percent from 270 to 341 positions while hospital costs associated with the services have increased 50% from 50 million to 75 million. And similarly, skilled nursing facilities expenses for traveling staff have also uh, increased in this time period. So with that context in mind, um, I think it's important to note Vermont was experiencing pre-pandemic um, declines in certain, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, workforce challenges in certain areas. Um, this is this is uh, information that was reported by the Rural Health Services Task Force and is also familiar uh, to this body, but that has been exacerbated by the. Uh, global health pandemic. The Workforce Development Strategic Plan makes recommendations to, uh, to address challenges with the healthcare workforce in a number of areas. These areas include recommendations for financial incentives, education and training, recruitment and retention, uh, regulation and strategies for uh, regulation to invite more participation in the workforce the practice of providers in the workforce and federal policy. Uh, the workforce strategic plan also recommends that there be some um, organizing aspect for these recommendations and recommends that there be a state collaboration, um, collaboration across agencies and departments to organize around the objectives in the strategic plan. It also recommends that the advisory group um, that uh, maintains the strategic plan be connected to the state workforce development board. And finally recommends that um, through collaboration across state agencies, there be uh, an established entity to serve as a health data hub to bring together disparate pieces of data and information that inform our understanding of the health workforce and that also would allow for supply and demand modeling so that we can better anticipate needs for the healthcare workforce. So those structural elements are also recommendations in this plan. Financial incentives for healthcare workers to live in Vermont uh, to live as permanent employees in Vermont, again, is one of the sections of recommendations in the plan. And here we recommend uh, broadening and expanding existing loan repayment programs based on an evaluation of existing data and potential new sources of data. The agent, uh, excuse me, the area health education centers should develop a proposal for expanding its service-based loan repayment pro program to include more healthcare professionals um, and increase current program offerings. And recommendations should include the funding necessary to increase existing loan repayment programs, as well as funding for including additional professional types in those loan re re repayment programs and considering how those programs can adequately include critical access hospitals, employees of FQHCs, 
and the increases necessary for nursing faculty in its programs. We also recommend, the plan also recommends increasing scholarship funding created by Act 155 of 2020, the same act uh, that enabled this plan, um, and identifying a permanent source for scholarship funding. The recommendations also include evaluating the effectiveness of the existing scholarship programs, making financial assistance and making financial assistance options for healthcare workforce clear, transparent, and easy to find. Um, and the plan recommends elevating VSAC as the wayfinder for information about healthcare education, financial planning, scholarship, and services, service opportunities. Um, we also in, recommend in the category of financial incentives, promoting permanent healthcare employment and residency in Vermont with financial incentives by revisiting tax incentives, incentive proposals. In, we recommend um, revisiting proposals and evaluating incentives that have been utilized by other states to recruit young professionals and healthcare workers to live and work as permanent resident <laughs> states. The team, should, but we also recommended considering tax exemption for preceptor income to encourage more health professionals in Vermont to participate in educating new professionals and consider whether tax incentives should be offered to employers who are offering housing or other benefits to full-time employees. And that is an important overlay for all of these recommendations. Um, certainly that housing, childcare um, are uh, equally important for the healthcare workforce as the workforce broadly and are um, certainly key prior priority areas when we think about our recruitment and retention efforts for this workforce as part of the broad workforce. We also recommended identifying barriers to the recruitment and retention of the non-licensed workforce. Uh, this includes home care providers. And we recommended specifically that the state interagency task team should identify and propose remedies to the most significant barriers for recruiting non-licensed <clears throat> allied health and direct support professionals to participate in Vermont's workforce. We also recommend the consideration of uh, one-time funds for healthcare employers to attract permanent employees. And here um, we recommend um, retention bonuses, relocation assistance, and housing support for permanent employed staff. I want to pause here because there has been in the budget adjustment part two and in the budget adjustment proposals to fund retention and recruitment um, activities uh, for the healthcare workforce. And in total, that's a $33 million investment that has been proposed um, here uh, consistent with this recommendation. We also recommend the consideration for a longer term grant incentive program, um, a program that would entice health professionals to seek permanent employment and residency in the state of Vermont. And here a program could be modeled after or expand upon a program like the remote worker grant program. Moving next to the group of recommendations that are focused on education and training to strengthen the healthcare workforce. The first recommendation is to increase enrollment in, nurse, in nursing programs. Uh, we recognize that there are barriers to increasing enrollment in nursing programs and the advisory group recommended further work on this issue to be facilitated by the Office of Professional Regulation and to include the schools of nursing and the clinical sites and healthcare organizations uh, working together to establish a preceptor model of clinical training so that 
opportunities for student nurses could be maximized so that the required clinical time could be realized uh, and that the work group would consider preceptorships across the care continuum, including home and community-based settings. The work group would also evaluate any gaps in compensation between academic faculty and practitioners, identify possible solutions, and make any further recommendations necessary, including funding. This working group would consider how nurses transitioning to retirement could be incentivized to work as nurse educators, and the working group would identify any additional barriers and recommendations for increasing enrollment in nursing programs. The advisory group also recommended support for transition to practice programs for professional roles, exploring um, funding to make investments in transition to practice programs. These investments could help to offset the cost of hiring new graduate clinicians and support um, for instructors. The, uh, we, we recommended evaluating the opportunities for funding and program of this kind. We see this as a training initiative and within that $33 million that I just referenced, um, we, have, uh, we have included an activity of this kind, um, support to transition to practice programs for professional roles. We also recommended strengthening, uh, we also recommended strengthening incent incentives for preceptors for all professions. Recommended exploring opportunities to expand family practice and residency programs, modifying the curriculum um, in uh, the university, it, modifying the, uh, medical school curriculum to introduce primary care earlier in medical school, advancing a coordinated approach to promote healthcare careers through the K-12 educational settings. Um, and here we recommend leveraging our existing resources with the area health education centers, uh, Vermont Student Assistance Corporation, Vermont After School, Vermont Career and Technical Education Centers and Vocational Rehab Programs, all working together to clearly document and develop a plan to actively promote healthcare careers in K-12 educational settings and ensuring that there's adequate funding for uh, these entities conducting this work. We also recommended establishing a physician assistant education program. Here, we recommend that the state colleges should study and provide a report to the legislature on the potential to offer a physician assistance education program, including an analysis of the employer demand for such a program. This study would include a timeline to implement any physician assistance program, as well as uh, lay out the resources that would be necessary to develop, equip staff and operate the program and include the timeline to obtain the accreditation that would be necessary to set up a program to support a first cohort. We also, the advisory group also recommends modifying curriculum to prepare students for work in interdisciplinary teams developing and identifying strategies to streamline the advancement through the nursing career ladder and to upskill existing staff. Here, the advisory group re recommends that healthcare providers should convene um, and develop and identify needs for on-site delivery of training and education programs to upskill existing staff. For example, to provide um, incentives and opportunity for LNAs to move to LPNs and beyond. We also in the advisory group recommended that um, we ensure that the healthcare career education is offered to all students before leaving mid middle school and that 
uh, there be further advertisement and recruitment of existing apprenticeship opportunities that are supported by the Department of Labor in the health sectors. Moving now to Additional recommendations for recruiting and retaining health professionals to work as permanent employees in the state of Vermont. The plan recommends inventorying and highlighting state programs that support recruitment and retention of health professionals. Um, for example, here the recommendation um, would include that the Department of Labor can clearly advertise its role and availability to assist Vermont organizations that are seeking international staff members through the foreign labor certification programs. Also recommending here that the Department of Labor can promote the apprenticeship program as just mentioned, and also um, its efforts to recruit current or former armed forces members with healthcare training. Uh, we also recommend modifying or expanding programs that support living and working in Vermont uh, for, for, all, um, for all folks coming into the Vermont workforce broadly, certainly, and where appropriate to highlight particular opportunities for healthcare uh, for healthcare providers. Um, these strategies would include highlighting, um, highlighting and identifying opportunities for healthcare employers, such as the Vermont Rental Housing Investment Program, and recommending how these programs and others could be modified, expanded, or newly implemented to have a greater impact as we seek to draw more, um, more workers into Vermont. We also recommend, the advisory group also recommends a marketing campaign to promote healthcare careers in Vermont and to do so by capitalizing on existing incentives to live and work in Vermont and also capitalizing on existing platforms and uh, modalities for recruiting um, and for um, elevating Vermont as a place to live and work largely. We also, the advisory group recommends promoting healthcare careers to new Vermonters. And here recommends that the refugee resettlement program work with healthcare employers to incorporate education and resources to encourage new Vermonters to work in the healthcare field and that the refugee resettlement program uh, promote the interim administrative rule for assessing foreign credentials, because this is a uh, speedier avenue to licensure. The advisor group also recommends developing a cross system strategy to utilize <laughs> this is, um, I apologize for the language here. Um, you may be more familiar with the home and community-based services 10% FMAP increase. And here we recommend, again, utilizing uh, these dollars um, for implementing evidence-informed cross-system uh, cross strategy. And again, um, these dollars uh, are contributing to that $33 million investment that the Agency of Human Services is seeking through budget adjustment and budget adjustment too as a total package to support recruitment, retention, and training for healthcare employers in Vermont. We also recommend um, promoting wellness and peer support programs and leveraging existing appropriations um, to ensure that there are resources available to address the issues of clinician burnout, which um, are, were issues prior to the pandemic. And certainly, like many challenges pre-pandemic, those challenges have um, certainly been amplified by the global health pandemic. And the final recommendation in this group is to reduce administrative burden for 
healthcare professionals. And here we recommend that the legislature should review the results of the reports being submitted pursuant to Act 140 of 2020 and take further action to implement recommendations included in those reports. The reports call for a review of how electronic health records can better streamline prior author authorization, how the all-payer ACO model can align and reduce prior authorizations, and ask for an analysis of DIVA's prior authorization waivers and updates on commercial payers and their implementation of the gold card pilot programs to reduce administrative burden. In the category of regulatory strategies that can help to address the healthcare workforce, the strategic plan recommends advertising and promoting the fast track for healthcare professional licensure for all OPR regulated professions and advertising and promoting uh, this work again through existing platforms and avenues for outreaching about um, employment in Vermont, such as the Think Vermont program. The advisory group in this report also recommends differentiating Canadian healthcare workers from international healthcare workers so that there can be an even further expedited path to licensure for Canadian healthcare workers interested in working in Vermont. This, uh, this strategic plan also recommends reducing license or licensing barriers for telehealth practice taking into account the recommendations that are forthcoming uh, from the work group created by Act 21 of 2021. The uh, further recommendation is to evaluate further opportunities to remove barriers to licensure for mental health and substance use disorder treatment professionals specifically. And the plan asks that within the next five years, the Office of Professional Regulation undertake a systematic review of the licensing process for mental health and substance use disorder treatment professionals and make recommendations to address barriers to licensure for these, uh, for these professionals specifically. And finally, in this group of recommendations, um, the advisory group recommends consideration for temporarily waiving licensure fees for first time licensing, licensed nursing assistants, uh, essentially to remove a further potential barrier to um, uh, moving into the healthcare workforce in Vermont. The advisory group also discussed modifications to the practice um, and how providers practice healthcare that could help to address the workforce challenges that we are confronting. And here recommend maximizing flexibility for reimbursement under uh, and utilizing in order to do that, um, the potential flexibility um, that we have via our all payer model agreement that allows for Medicare to pay differently in the state of Vermont. This is a very specific uh, recommendation. And it was also a recommendation from the Rural Health Services Task Force um, that the AHS, as well as the Green Mountain Care Board, negotiate um, for more flexible reimbursement policy to address service site and geographic restrictions that Medicare has in, and including reimbursement for audio only services that are more expansive um, that, and are certainly being used more expansively after the and during the public health emergency um, as, as examples. We also recommend developing commercial reimbursement models for audio only services, expanding telehealth coverage, making telehealth billing requirements clear and establishing a statewide telepsychiatry program in emergency, in emergency departments. In this recommendation, uh, we recommend that um, we explore a telehealth 
a telepsychiatry program that is similar to that in North Carolina. Um, North Carolina has a statewide telepsychiatry program that would help treat and divert psychiatric patients that seek care in emergency departments. And finally, I want to highlight the, the um, report does include a, quite, a, quite a significant number of um, federal uh, policy uh, priorities that rise to the federal level. But I'd like to highlight spe specifically today the advisory committee's recommendation that there be federal action uh, and support for strategies that would minimize the increasing trend toward travel staffing. This trend, as I highlighted earlier in my presentation, is resulting in unsustainable cost increases for healthcare employers. Uh, we, in the report, recommend exploring anti-poaching provisions that would be directed at travel staffing agencies, at the federal level, exploring price gouging prohibitions, and reforming federal tax incentives where um, that are uh, beneficial for the traveling staffing and traveling staff. Healthcare organizations have a very difficult time competing with these staffing agencies due to the federal tax benefits. These benefits include non-taxed housing stipends, non-tax per diem, such as meals and incidentals, and non-tax travel reimbursements. And certainly the recruitment and retention proposals um, that have brought forward, that have been brought forward to date uh, do recognize uh, the environment um, for healthcare employers to recruit, train, and retain permanent staff uh, has become uh, much more competitive. Um, it's become much more competitive between the states and the nation that are working to attract and retain healthcare staff during this during this pandemic and this unprecedented time of uh, healthcare workforce uh, decline. And as well, uh, states competing with one another and employers also uh, competing for staff with these staffing agencies. That, that concludes my overview of the Workforce Development Strategic Plan. And I'm happy to stop screen sharing or however yeah, so, you think. You know, thank you so much, Ina. There's a great deal of work in this and the, <clears throat> the advisory group has done uh, an exceptional amount of work. It looks uh, and somewhat um, an extension of the work from uh, our previous uh, rural health care task force and some of the other conversations that we've had in the legislature, but it's a huge step forward. And thank you for bringing this to us. So I think it would be helpful. I, I have one question on the last screen before you take your uh, screen down, and that is, the federal tax um, yeah, incentives that are there. Uh, I guess my, <laughs> you know, if we were to step out and put some taxation on these things at the, at the local level, that would put us out of step with the rest of the country and then we would lose. And if we put restrictions on our traveling staff, regardless of nurse, we hear mostly about nurses, if we put restrictions on them and said for every every amount of uh, time you spend as a traveler, we look for a commitment as a resident, you know, some something like that, then that puts us out of step with others. And I'm questioning whether or not you you and the administration has reached out to a coalition of states to begin to build. Um, a pushback on the uh, traveling staff and on traveling nurses, because it's going to take a critical mass to, um, to make that happen. Now, uh, for me, I have former students who have become traveling nurses and they do exceedingly well, but it, it is not at this point, it is undermining our healthcare uh, resources. So 
the question I have for you is, is, was there a discussion about any kind of regional or broader statewide connection to um, look at reducing numbers of travelers, you know, by reducing the, the payment scale, whatever? Thank you for the question. I, I'm fortunate to be able to connect with, with uh, several um, uh, national healthcare organizations. I think you're familiar with the National Academy for State Health Policy, uh, for instance, as well as uh, Milbank Memorial Fund. And through those avenues where I am fortunate to be able to participate in, in discussions and to share information, uh, I have shared with the National Academy for State Health Policy this workforce development strategic plan. And I do know um, that that is an area that others, particular to traveling staffing agencies, other states have also come forward um, uh, to, to bring this issue forward. Uh, what next steps there may be, um, I think is still uh, an open question but I have used those forums that again, I'm fortunate to have the opportunity to work with um, to bring this message from Vermont and to um, seek out whether or not other states are experiencing these issues and they are. Oh uh, yeah, they sure, <laughs> yeah, they are. Oh, why don't you take your um, screen share down and we can come back to it if we need to. We also have this on our um, iPads, so this is helpful. Um, so the, uh, just to, to continue with the thought on multi-state initiatives, I know a, a lot of this might be on the shoulders of our of VAS and having those folks get together with their counterparts in other states or have the national organization come up with some policy on travelers that would help Vermont. You know, it's it's not going to help Vermont if we step out all alone. So, um, just uh, and I I would think probably I'm I'm thinking that some of the Vaz folks are um, listening on YouTube, and I they they'll probably tell me they can't do this, but uh, it's a difficult time. I get it, uh, but having some coalition building uh, outside of our borders would really help. Uh, so, committee, uh, this is a this is a this is a long report, and I don't know if you've had a chance to read the entire report, but I would recommend that you do that. And uh, there are some very tiny places where the legislature uh, ha has some recommendations, knowing that all of this started uh, legislatively, and we feel a strong obligation to continuing our work and responsibility. Um, I do have a, I had, I do have a couple questions, uh, and I, so I'm going to go forward with those. And then if other folks have questions and we'll get into some discussion, I hope, um, the, it, the, um, interagency task team that you've talked about, and then merging with the workforce development bill, uh, board, it seems like a very good idea. My concern is that that's something that is an administrative step. And if it happens administratively, then we know that administrations change and uh, we might lose that. My, so my question is, was there discussion about having that task force be embedded in statute, or e even if for a short period of time to ensure that this work continues? No, we did not. the The group did did not discuss uh, that particular question, and certainly um, the coordination effort I think is one where we are among agencies and departments, particularly um, having um, uh, had you know consistent coordination. Um, to address the public health emergency and throughout this pandemic, a truly cross agency and department response, uh, we really sought to, in this recommendation, we really sought to continue that 
track record of working together um, to address these sorts of issues. So I think we're all for that. Uh, but you know, we are legislators. So we look for ways that we can help promote uh, that work. And so that might, we might put that on the table for discussion, pros and cons there. Uh, and, and then looking at the advisory task force, obviously there were no legislators on it. It was more of a uh, outside work and we're, we're pleased that that happened. But sometimes when we look at these things, we understand that there might be some more discrete legislation needed to keep this stuff going. And I included that some of the funding pieces, uh, the housing pieces that you mentioned, all of those things fall on our shoulders so that we can keep, uh, keep going. Uh, not, not the least of which, um, when you start talking about doing some kind of a market analysis for increasing the number of PAs in the state um, and or, it's there and I, I, I do have a couple other things. So just, just sharing with you as a legislator, when, when I go through this, I see places where we can place our hands and help. And it's not a matter of intrusion, it's a matter of support. So uh, we'll, as we work on this, our committee in particular, since it's healthcare, hello, uh, <laughs> Uh, I hope we'll have a lot to uh, to provide in uh, in help uh, because we want to do that. Um, and as some of us have um, a long history of experience in the healthcare environment, and in particular with uh, the work that AHEC is doing, and then with uh, programs at the collegiate level and others. So uh, we'll be working on that. Um, I do have a couple questions. I noticed in there that uh, that the data indicates in the report itself that there's, and we know this, there's been a, a, a drop in our primary care providers in the state. At the same time, we've seen an increase in PAs. And the, uh, the recommendation is to have a PA program in the state. I find that really important. I, I myself uh, worked to build a PA program a long time ago uh, and it, it, it didn't happen, but maybe this time it will. And, but there, the education committee and the health and welfare committee can work together on this with our, our state colleges to ensure that some kind of a clinical placement program is there uh, but it's not going to happen if we don't have the primary care offices. So your recommendation on increasing primary care incentives is absolutely key. And building greater primary care presence in the medical school curriculum is, is probably key. And I'm pleased that Charlie McLean was on the advisory group. So that message perhaps will get back to uh, the med school. We don't legislate the curriculum, but we can make recommendations. And that's for all of this, this whole area. We want to make people available to do the teaching and the conditions available, but um, we can't say teach X, Y, or C. Uh, well, maybe the education committee wants to get involved with that, but Senator Hooker, you can <laughs> we can do that. I'm I'm really glad that you're you're bringing these points out, Senator Lyons, because it occurred to me as we were listening to Ms. Backus that you know, we've heard all of these <clears throat> points in various parts of our legislative lives, and um, it it would be important for us to know exactly where we can affect the change. So, <clears throat> looking forward to that. I I really like the idea of highlighting healthcare careers in elementary school, you know, and all the way through. And, you know, there is a lot that we can do. So, and that actually, that's a question I had. And, uh, and, and I'm, Senator Cummings, you're next, I got it. Um, the, um, as you're going through, uh, and obviously elementary, middle school, by middle school, you need to have something, extracurricular activities is critical for careers in, in earlier ages. Um, but the, um, the question I had is, there's a lot in here about healthcare, 
and there is a mention of DAs and a substance use disorder and mental health, where uh, for me, the continuation of a, of a strong um, healthcare environment, it goes into counseling. And uh, so our job in here is gonna be to look at mental health and substance use disorder folks, as well as um, the PAs and the PCs and so on. Uh, so can you mention, talk a little bit about any conversation that you had around mental health or substance use disorder counseling or extending even into the recovery or, or other areas? Yeah, absolutely. The The committee did include, um, it did include membership that were also involved with um, uh, workforce development, um, planning and conversations um, uh, uh, focused on the designated agency workforce particularly. So we had that cross pollination of membership in the committees, um, in this advisory committee and, and, and the um, designated agency focused workforce work group. Uh, and I think you can see the um, Partic in some particular places um, where recommendations are specific for mental health and substance use disorder workforce professionals, such as the uh, example with licensure and barriers to licensure. I think that there are some significant barriers in how credentials are assessed for that group of professionals that does make licensure more, or obtaining licensure in the state of Vermont more challenging for those professionals. Um, that's one example. However, there's some other important uh, work that the advisory committee recommended to evaluate the opportunities for loan repayment and scholarship for a broader range of healthcare professional types. And in that recommendation, we were thinking specifically of mental health and substance use disorder provider professionals in evaluating what opportunities there might be for inclusion of, again, a broader range of health professional types. And I also, um, the report does have the recommendations regarding the non-licensed work Force or the direct support professionals or direct support workers. There's a lot of acronyms that are um, competing right now, and I'm not sure which is the best one to use to describe that workforce, but that is certainly a workforce that designated and specialized services agencies employ, uh, and we do recognize the particular challenges in that workforce. So, yeah, the support staff, uh, you know, yes. so critical. Uh, I, I have other questions, but I'm going to ask Senator Cummings to go ahead. You're muted, Senator. Okay, I'm as bad as my committee members. Um, <laughs> recruiting, we should get a TV show with the latest TV pre-adolescent heartthrob starring as an LNA, which would probably do more to increase the profession than anything. <laughs> or a, what are they, influencer blogs? But yeah. um, you know, what, what I'm interested in is we've had testimony in the past about the reimbursement rates. Um, we've got the reimbursement and primary care is where it hits the reimbursement rates for independent practices that are not affiliated with our one mega teaching hospital. We've also lost a whole slew of pediatricians up, um, in Franklin County. We've heard testimony from other doctors that if you are located in an area that is primarily reimbursed with Medicaid rates, okay. you cannot make it which means that we have a wide disparity. And a, a lot of this is, in a lot of areas is coming down to dollars. Um, we're talking about reimbursing the rates uh, for the, the last bill we looked at for home and community. And I think we all know, yes, we have a crisis there. It's, it's dying. Um, 
we need to talk about that. And again, every year I get three, four bills in my other committee asking to tax the rich for a new program. But if we're going to reimburse this, we need to talk about ongoing revenue. And right now, the reason many of these programs are underfunded is we don't have the revenue. And so if we're going to put it here, unless we come up with new revenue, we're going to take it from somewhere else. And then in five years, we'll be looking at that crisis. And I know you're going to send that down to the hall. Yeah. But that, I mean, that just, it's the reality, it, but but know. Senator, you are you know you you're on target, and these are the things that we continue to talk about in in here. Mm -hmm. And do um, we're going to we're going to take some steps. I I guess yeah. The overarching issue is um, maintaining some sustainable funding, and yeah. But but I do have a question. For for Ina on this, Director Backus, um, the we have this whole healthcare crisis, whether it's substance use disorder counseling, mental health, nursing, primary care, whatever it is, it's exacerbated by pandemic. No no question. And without the pandemic, we would be limping along and okay, you know, we're going to do this, that, and the other thing. Now we're looking at a statewide strategic plan that we initiated during the early stages of the pandemic. So we do have federal dollars coming to us or here, and we must be able to coordinate some investment of those federal dollars into a lot of the things that you've listed. I, I could see, I could see the whole um, work to build a, a PA program or to enhance primary care, um, education, substance use, mental health education to build out some programs. Maybe I don't even know what the guidelines are relative to an endowed chair at a college for a specific program. And sometimes it's the endowed chair that brings the star faculty member that then highlights that program across the country. So my question is, have you looked at ARPA dollars and maybe strategic and uh, creative ways of using those dollars? As, as the plan is, is clear, we, we're certainly looking to maximize the 10% increase for home and community-based services providers. That is a federal government program specifically to strengthen that workforce. And, as we've, and we will continue to testify to in pairing that in those investments uh, with other funds to, to really create um, a strong, um, a strong investment in retention recruitment programs um, for the areas that you've named um, outside of those, of those initiatives. I have not, and the advisory group did not look specifically at ARPA dollars as, as a source um, for those activities, such as a K through 12 curriculum, you know, design for instance, or, or the establishment of, um, of a physician's assistant, uh, a PA program. As another example, we did um, in doing our work, uh, we did identify, as you as you kind of just got the whirlwind tour, numerous areas, uh, numerous areas where we would recommend um, further work and study to evaluate those opportunities and um, and to identify potential funding sources. Um, the plan is clear in a number of areas that the groups that would. Uh, that would be doing the work to evaluate the need um, would also be evaluating potential funding sources. So I guess 
I guess my concern, and, and then Senator Hooker has, has a question, a comment, uh, is we're on a fast track. <laughs> you know, so yeah. can we wait? So uh, I'm I'm interested in what can we do that will facilitate. And there will I'm going to send when I go in to talk with Senator Campion in education, I'm going to say, you know, what what monies what monies are available in our elementary and secondary mm -hmm. schools to promote some of this um, and work collaboratively with AHEC or others. You know, so you know, we need to we need to step on this so fast. <laughs> yeah. And I just think that, you know, we have to look at what the restrictions are on the ARPA funds. <clears throat> you know, is there a time limit? We're up against that time limit. You know, what can we do that um, will get things done quickly? You know, I'm, I'm thinking as you, you spoke, Senator Lyons, I was thinking about um, loan reimbursement, you know, as a this is a one time thing. We could pay off loans for right. for physicians to come here. We could pay off loans for nurses. We could and these are things that we've talked about in other other committees or in our yeah. committee. Yeah. And um, I'm just wondering <laughs> what the what the group is going to do to push these things quickly. So I guess at this point you know, first, before I ask my question, I, I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you uh, for all the work that you have done on this, the, the fact that you are stimulating questions and discussion means that you've really taken us to the edge of the cliff. And uh, we greatly appreciate everything that you and the advisory group has done and everyone else who's weighed in on this. So the questions aren't criticism. The questions are next steps and how can we promote the work that you've done? And um, I, I probably should have said that in the beginning. <laughs> I say thank you. Um, but I do have one question. You, you talk about cross system strategies and um are you thinking about um cross agency department or system in terms of healthcare, economic development housing what what are the systems that are in that embedded in that and then josh has a question uh, senator taranzini has a question it that it's an excellent question it's certainly a theme throughout the plan that there does need to be cross system approaches um, to the issue of workforce development. And again, workforce development is um, a challenge across sectors. It is not only a challenge for the health sector. And so we do have um, an important opportunity that we must seize to uh, to emphasize workforce development across sectors to include healthcare, um, very importantly, but in the realm of investments in um, or, or work to address the issues with housing um, in that we have, uh, the issues with childcare, those are important cross sector examples of cross sector approaches um, and approaches that are applicable broadly and to the healthcare. Uh, professionals as well that we would like to recruit to Vermont. We also talk in the report about um, cross system collaboration within the healthcare system. And for example, um, team based care being a way to, if you will, spread our resources further um, to promote uh, perhaps um, more satisfaction in care delivery on behalf of those professionals who um, can benefit from being trained to work in teams and to be able to uh, rely on one another as colleagues in providing the best high quality care to individuals. So that's a that's at a, um, a health system level um, in, in, in that example. So we have a couple of levels um, where we're really 
through our recommendations here, promoting collaboration across uh, state government, broad sectors, and within the health sector specifically. Okay, thank you. I, I, I thought that was the case because it came up several different places in different ways. So that's helpful. Thank you. Senator Terenzini. Thank you, Senator Lyons. I just wanted to piggyback something that Senator Hooker said that um, was interesting. You know, we, we talk about all the problems. We know we have a retention problem. We know that we have, um, you know, we can't, we can't place enough of these people or these students right now in clinical settings because of the, you know, the limited spaces and so on. And, you know, Senator Hooker, I, you know, as you said, we have billion dollars, $2 billion, whatever the number is, and, you know, maybe maybe it's something that we have a committee bill or whatever that says we want, I don't know what the number is, pick a number, $5 million, $10 million, whatever the number is, uh, set aside specifically for the repayment of student loans or the promise that if you come here and nurse or you open your medical practice for the next 10 years, we'll, we'll pay your licensure fee, we'll, we'll do something to incentivize you to come here because whatever whatever we're doing right now and i don't mean us but i mean whatever we're doing collectively isn't isn't getting the job done so um food it's for thought in the city yeah yeah good so. yes very good you know you you raise the issue um uh, we do have our act six work before us and uh uh the other the other uh, laws that we put into place and so that will be our kind of our short term, let's get this work going. But we, then we also talked yesterday and we'll continue to talk about the workforce issue as a longer, some longer term stuff. So I think the act six falls into the category of telehealth, telemedicine a little bit. And we'll maybe we'll look and see if there's something we can add there. But then our longer term bill that we hope to get out before the end of the session we will be putting some of this in and I, I, your suggestion is a good one, well taken uh, that, and I know AHEC has done incredible, incredible work on uh, loan repayment. Uh, so the expansion of that that's suggested in the workforce report uh, dovetails with what you're suggesting, Senator Terenzini, good. Um, and then the other one that I, I was, pleased to see was the recommendation around the EHR, the Act 140 um, electronic health record. And um, can you just elaborate a, a tiny bit on that one? Is that possible or we, we can wait and get more testimony? I'm just, I, can you, Kitty, we're on the floor, aren't we 10 minutes ago? No, Did today's, I Today's Thursday, Senator. That's right. It's one. Tomorrow right. is ten. All right. Okay. We're gonna. I'm yeah, good. We're just we're just about to wrap up, but I want to make sure that we get all our questions answered. And Ina has. Yeah. No, I just that... saw the thing come up, and for some reason, I was thinking it was eleven thirty. We were out. Tomorrow. Okay. Tomorrow. I'll get I'll get acclimated yet. I know it's going to take time. I think it was something about prior authorization related to EHR or an expansion of our electronic health records. And that, and I'm, my question is, is that going to be more inclusive for different practitioners or I'm just, and it's a question. Let, I, I've moved back in my, in my notes so that I can, I can review. Let me know if you can't see me. Um, I can't see you for the moment, but I'll. Okay. No, nope. okay. <laughs> um, I can hear you. That's important. Okay. Um, the recommendation regarding the reduction of administrative burden, um, there are reports that are being submitted pursuant to Act 140 of 2020. And those reports um, will, will provide some insights into how electronic health records can better streamline prior authorization. Um, so that's, the report is anticipated for the legislature. The report, the charge in that report, if I understand clearly, was to uh, review how the electronic health re records can be streamlined to promote prior, to, to address, um, to, 
to address prior authorization administrative burden. So how the electronic health record can help to reduce the administrative burden associated with prior authorizations. So that, as I understand, is a report perhaps that has been received already or that is pending for receipt by the legislature. And the advisory group thought it would be important that the legislature review the recommendations within it in case there were places for further action. Good, thank you for that clarity. That's helpful. And we will be looking at reports and hopefully get to that one. Um, I do have one last question uh, that is, as the group was going through the whole um, improvement through the higher ed or any educational programs, knowing that there's a lot there. I mean, there's certification programs or tech ed programs, all of the, that work and that we've been interested in the past. But what conversation was there about uh, enhancing the remote learning environment for some of these more, um, more specialized areas. Did the advisory group consider whether remote learning could be an avenue for persons to gain education training? Uh, and, in and, and I listen, I know that it's being used for, you know, I know that some of the master's programs at NVU are totally online. Uh, and I know that CCV is very much of an online environment. Um, they're stepping stones. And uh, to what extent other uh, programs and higher ed uh, institutions are utilizing remote. I know, I know we've heard how difficult it is for high school kids, but there might be some advantage for technical schools and others where there's certification, including childcare, uh, to remote into a, a clinical placement. Uh, I, you know, so I'm just wondering. I think I think that that's a really creative way to think about the issues. We didn't, um, and and. The group, the group may want to uh, keep me honest in my memory here. I, I, I can review our notes from our discussions. It's not occurring to me that we had that specific discussion, but one thing that we did discuss and we did highlight as a future area for consideration was whether or not simulation experience could um, be a way for people to gain critical clinical um, critical clinical time. So that that is, it's not remote um, per se, but it wasn't, that was an area of discussion that seems similar to what you were raising in whether the remote opportunities were discussed. Right, I do think that remote simulation is not a bad idea. And of course it depends on what you're doing. You're not gonna be doing surgery that way, but um, well, you know, telemedicine started with some pretty, hands-on stuff, but so just a thought, and this is something we might be talking about and exploring. And as, as you and your team um, uh, are interested in helping us with our legislative uh, work, because we are gonna work on this in here, um, it, it would be helpful first uh, topics and people who uh, they may be listening in right now, it'd be great, um, that can help us formulate some of these ideas into a way that will push things forward. And knowing that whatever we do, I mean, it's, it seems like resources are at the bottom of it. So whether it's loan repayment or expansion of a, of a program somewhere. So we look to you for your, um, recommendations on who we can have in to help us on workforce. As I said before, Act 6 is in front of us. We'll continue our work on that. We'll be formulating a committee bill, either we or the health, House Health Care will be doing that. And then we will be formulating a newer long-term bill. And I, I see workforce as being a part of that. We might use a bill that we currently have in committee. We'll just see you know, how that sugars off, but 
your uh, insight and help with with this will be um, very valuable. Questions committee. Just just one comment, and I don't know if it belongs here or in education, but an increase in apprenticeship programs, I think, is really critical. Um, not everybody goes through the, you know, the traditional schooling to learn skills, and you know that that's across the board. I mean, whether it's the trades or healthcare, LNA, stackable credentials, all of those things that we need to talk about, so that we can encourage people and help people to get through to gain the experience they need to increase our workforce. We could use our little CEU bill to do that. and then send it to education. Yeah, okay. Whatever it takes, Senator. <laughs> you know it, okay. And we could use a dental bill to do some of this. I mean, there's a lot. All right, any other questions for Ina? All right, um, thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate your time and the work that you've done on the report. And this is just the surface of the report. We'll start diving in a little bit and putting together some thoughts and we'll rely on you for uh, your help in doing that. So thank you. Thank you as well for your thoughts and recommendations and your feedback. All right, terrific.